So in the summer of 1944, I reckon- Oh, it was a beautiful summer. Uh, some parts of the world, some parts of the world, not so beautiful. And in particular, Munich, I reckon, wouldn't have been a super nice place to be. Nicht so good in München? Yeah, München, München. Uh, you know, so Munich, as um, the, mm. a significant German military industrial city and also the Nazi homeland, they had an official Nazi homeland policy. Um, oh, Jesus. Yeah, no, they, a lot of big stuff for them happened there. Oh. But, but it was a target for a lot of Allied bombing. You know, the Allies were like, okay, no. there's like a diesel plant nearby and an engine factory and they make some other shit, but also all of these Nazi uh, cultural sites. Let's bomb the shit out of them. Now, of course... Can I, sorry, Nazi cultural sites? Like This is where we invented the Schwarzstika? Uh, not this quite. is the Hugo Boss Suit Emporium? <laughs> the Hugo Boss Suit Emporium. Fine hemp und, und Hosen? No, like 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 the, the Hofbrau House where, where the Nazis held their first meeting. Oh, or, yeah, okay. or the Old yeah. Town Hall, which had a, had a German name, which is basically turn your head on the side, Als Town Hall, um, where Goebbels organised the Kristallnacht. Uh, uh, Jesus. So, right. so stuff like that, like like Munich's yep. Munich's where they they were little babies and where they did, they did their evil baby stuff, not their mm. evil grown up stuff. Mm. Um, anyway, so yeah, the, the the Allies were pretty keen on bombing Munich. So throughout the war, it was bombed something like seventy four times, and it, and it got more and more. You know, through uh, mm. 1942, 1943, 1944. You know, and and I was reading about this, so. Um, in that summer, every not every night, but when when the bombings would happen, you'd get like seven hundred bombers, eight hundred fighter planes. This is just the the seven hundred bombers. Yeah, and that's so. So if the Americans were doing it or the English were doing it, they'd, they'd be like so. So imagine <sighs> fifteen hundred planes, of which you know half of them are bombers. I, I don't even know. I, I, I just can't even. Like I knew it was big, but I thought it'd be like oh, we sent eighty. No, no, it's it is like the sky okay. would be covered, covered, Fucking with black with planes. planes, black with planes. Yeah, totally. And here's the Jesus. other thing. Here's the other thing. Um, in Munich, in particular, I don't know if it's like the shape of the city in terms of the mountains. This yeah. is where this is where they perfected a technique of bombing from just seven hundred feet, which is like two hundred meters or so. Um, so I reckon, it, I reckon at two hundred meters, you can pretty much see the pilots. Um, when they're dropping the bombs on you, so yeah. and, you, and and the faces of the people upon whom you drop the bombs. Yes, indeed. So I'm delightful. I'm just trying. You know, um, <clears throat> throughout throughout the the war, uh, six thousand six hundred people were killed in Munich in the bombings. Um, as okay. much as as much as ninety percent of the old city was destroyed, or um, or severely damaged, the deadliest one night was the sixteenth of July, nineteen forty four, when uh, fourteen hundred people were killed, uh, four and a half thousand were uh, wounded, and. Throughout that time, it, it honestly sounds less than if you'd asked me to estimate, I would have put at least a zero on all of that. That's yeah, amazing. I get it. Uh, well, it's a not city. Great. It's a not city. Great. It's a city of like a million people, and yeah, okay. um, something like forty percent of the city fled during during that summer. Yeah. It's like screw this. I'm heading for the hills. This is this is terrible. So you know where they went? They went to Hitler's summer camp from a few episodes ago. They might have done. They they, they really really might have done. So. I just want to I just want to paint a picture because you know that's uh, it would have been pretty freaking horrible and mm. I get I get there were Nazis who were baddies there but there were also civilians there were also children there were, there were a lot of people that they're just trying yep. to live their lives as best they could it would have been horrible it would have yep. been it would have been worse of course if you had a Jewish grandmother uh, just a grandmother not a mother uh, or if you it would have been bad then too but it would have been worse as so. well if you'd been accused by the Nazis of employing uh, Jewish assistance or mm. if you had been in, accused of doing Jewish science but um, still uh -huh. despite science. all this cool. despite cool. all this cool. in the mm. middle of this chaos this all of this death and <clears throat> and Nazi hate someone did something special Welcome to The Wholesome Show, science stories for people who sit up the back of the bomber. I guess if you're in a, uh, like a bomber, you could be listening to podcasts. I don't know these days, maybe. You do, because if you're the gunner, you've got nothing to do until you get there. Yeah. I was going to do something else, but I didn't, so I'm a gunner <laughs> and I waited until I got there. The Wholesome Show is me, Will Grant. Me, Dr. Roderick Griffin, never been bombed Lamberts. 
lucky you. Uh, I know. Neither have I. I've been smashed but not bombed. And it's brought to you by the Australian National Centre for the Public Awareness of Science. Mm. And not, and but not Jewish science. Are we going to get into that at all? That's um, uh, just the you, idea I'll of it. I'll tell like, you a story, man. I'll tell you a story. I just, I just love that. You have been doing Jewish science. It's like <laughs> that. That doesn't make sense. Uh, but yeah, how do you, how do you, how do you, how do you, how do you refute that? I don't know. I don't. I know th- this science hangs its meat upside down and kills it in a special way. Like I don't. It, it's just dumb. Think, you mean you're think, a Jew doing science? That's I think different. that might have been it. But that's, but um, I'll let you in on a secret. Uh, okay. Well, I'm not going to. I'm not going to tell you all tell of that. Else. I'm not going to tell you all that. Um, yeah. Oh, just before you get started, hey, if you are in, mm. no, you don't even need to be in Canberra. Mm-mm. What's happening next week? We're doing a live show. So next yeah. week, if you're listening to this episode soon after it's being released in uh, September 2021, you can come to a live show. We're doing a live show next week on Wednesday the eighth. Is it the eighth? I'm just checking. <laughs> yeah, it's the eighth. I'm looking at my phone. Yes, Wednesday the eighth. <laughs> 7 p.m. Uh, Kayleen Canberra time. time. Canberra time. Kayleen, Bell Conan, the southern part, sorry, eastern states of the ACT, I mean Australia time. If you're in Adelaide, I, I don't know what to tell you. I don't even know if you have oh, time. Oh, it's 15 minutes before or after, I think. Do they do they know that? Do they know what an hour is? I don't think they do. No, no, they count time in 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 fifteen minute units. It's it's a it's, it's a true. city of lawyers. They're, they're all lawyers. They count time in <laughs> the billing increments be, of seven minutes. That's like a minute and a half, isn't it? You, I spoke to you for two and a half billing units. That'll be nine thousand dollars. <laughs> anyway, come along, enjoy. I think there's a link out there. Um, check our Twitter feed. Uh, we'll have a link to where you can get the tickets, which cost the giant price of. Zero thousand dollars. Oh no, zero million dollars. Zero million dollars. Fuck it. Zero billion dollars. You have to pay entirely no billion dollars <laughs> to get a ticket. But they um they will be limited because there's only so many people that can dial in, right? As a I believe so. I don't know. As a top end. I think it's eight eighty five thousand people. Yeah, cool. Sta- standing them out here, listen. <laughs> we humans have been eating honey and keeping bees. For thousands of years. We- you know, I, I knew you were going to talk about honey. It was just so obvious. I mean, that was just, it's not even a non sequitur. It's an absolutely obvious. It's just like, you haven't even fooled me. My God, I know, I'm I bored. Know, that's what you were I'm thinking. bored. <laughs> Bombs, honey, Nazis, no question. It's got Carry it all. Look, look, we've probably been eating honey for well since before we were humans because we know that bears eat honey and we are obviously- Humans used to be bears? Yes, descended from the bears, or we have a, right. a similar ancestor. Although I, I was looking yeah. into this the other day, bears yeah. don't don't just eat honey; they what? they eat the bees as well and the larvae. <laughs> <laughs> yes, go bears! What are you eating here? Everything's got honey on it. <laughs> Sticks, cars. I don't give a shit. Fair enough, though. They're big. They I, can do it. I know, I know, but um, the sweetness of the honey and the wriggliness and spikiness of the bee. I think it's a uh, Bears are pretty tough. Mm. Uh, they are. They are. Uh, look, the the earliest evidence that we've been eating honey is like cave paintings from uh, ten thousand years ago. There's there's pictures of people harvesting honey. Um, looks like someone is with, it, with long it? hair and a bo- <clears throat> long hair and a basket actually harvesting honey. It's pretty cool. That's pretty much you. Uh, it, it it is pretty much me. Are those giant things bees? Yeah, they're bees. They're fucking murder hornets. They're no, huge. No, no, size no. of small aircraft. It's cave painting. They've only got really thick brushes back then. Like uh, must use finger. Finger yeah. too big to be small bee. <laughs> uh, so that's 10,000 years ago, but we've got actually actual beekeeping pottery vessels from 9,000 years ago. Um, cool. So, so we've definitely been doing it for a long time. And yeah. one of the other things I was reading about is they discovered in, uh, in the Jordan Valley in Israel recently um, a bronze or Iron Age um, ancient honey factory. So, um, real, that's cool. Yeah. It's, it, so they found 30 intact hives, but there probably would have been like a hundred or, or maybe more in the whole factory. Um, and it's, they're, they're 3000 years old, would have produced like 500 kilos of honey a year. Damn. Oh, it's awesome. Such a cool that's thing. That's wild. Yeah. That's super wild. So as we've been, you know, uh, looking at honey, looking at bees and looking after bees for all that time, it's no surprise that people have been uh, thinking about, observing, maybe doing a bit of science on bees for a long, long time. And to be fair, I mean, it, it has to be brought up now that the centre administer, the, the centre manager at CPAS is a woman called B, and she keeps bees. Wow, no. So we had no choice but to do this episode. This is for you, B. B, if you're listening, this is a story about bees. <clears throat> um, 
So, so some of the earliest stuff that we've got written on bees is Aristotle. So when he stopped doing uh, like rhetoric and theories of plays and stuff like that, he's like, I'm going to write some stuff on bees now. Um, he did do, he did do some, he did some sensible stuff. He did some wacky stuff as well. So the sensible stuff, he was like, how much, how much honey comes out of a beehive? I don't know what Aristotle's voice is. Um, how much honey comes out of a beehive, huh? <laughs> yes, that, that's obviously Because he's Aristotle. Italian, not Greek. Oh, no, it should be Greek. How much honey comes out of the Greek hive? <laughs> I apologize. Uh, five to 18 pints per year uh, is what he got. Uh, he, tested, yeah, okay. he tested if bees are like the figs. Um, and they do. I like figs? Uh, no, they, if, they, they, like, do if, like if figs. they like figs, if they like figs, they, they do like figs. So um, a pint is 600 mils, right? I don't know. It's, a, it's, a, it's what you measure the beer in. So 600 you get, mils. You can get five beers or 18 beers uh, okay. out, of, out of a hive. So fif- did you say 15 pints uh, of honey from a hive? 18, 18 pints of honey. It, it, and that was rare. That was, uh, that, that was big. Yeah. Per year. Oh, back in those days, they had to smash the hive and kill everything to get the honey. Uh, <laughs> so they're bears. Y- y- yeah. No. <laughs> they, they were not a, like, the invention of a, a use again hive or keep it going hive is a much more modern thing. They, they, I don't even think of that. So they got an actual hive. It's like, time to get the honey. Sorry, fuckers. <laughs> gone. Yeah, you're, you're getting torch bees. Yeah, so they, yeah. It, okay. It, uh, honey, okay. Honey is not vegan now. Uh, never will be. But it was certainly not vegetarian back then because it involved a lot of killing of the animals. Um, and probably had bits of the animals in the honey. Sure, sure. That's that delicious crunch you pay extra for. Uh, what else did he work out? Oh, he worked out. He was one of the first to work out there's different types of bee. Um, yeah. So he knew that there was like bees, the worker bees, and then mm. there were drones, which he said is the largest of them all, has no sting and is stupid, which... That's how I've always thought of drones. It's a bit unfair. Like, why, why, why come? And and then he said, "There's a king," um, which of course is it's a king, which is odd. Yeah, uh, I, yeah. Um, no. it's got to be a male. It's in charge. Well, he observed that when bees swarm, they would then all follow their king. Um, so he thought yeah, it must be the king. They're following the king. Yeah, um, it's but the king, the weird thing is that he didn't know how bees reproduced, um, or in fact, if they did reproduce at all. Uh, he, he went, he did a bit of a lit review at this point. He said, yeah, uh, good. other sources, people have said, um, they're not sure about how they reproduce or if they reproduce at all. I don't, I don't know what that means. If they reproduce at all. That's yeah. A- but this is an age where maybe they were born whole out of rocks or something still, right? Well, that's what they said. Uh, he thought, he thought maybe, maybe bees, um, find and collect their offspring from flowers. Uh, cause you see bees around flowers a lot. So maybe what they're doing is collecting their babies. And he was, let's be clear. He also thought human babies came uh, with storks? I don't know. I don't know or in, what the, in the pumpkin patch? I, I, the thing that's weird is Aristotle is a famous smart guy. Like he is he is in his, some ways. He is historic No, he he's historically smart. He he did a sure. lot of really thoughtful things, but the, he did. it's really dumb to think bees grow on flowers. Not his fault. Not his fault. Oh, um <laughs> I don't know if it isn't. Just as an aside, there was, there was this cool, when I was looking through this story, there was this cool bit about, um, so practical beekeeping has, you know, yeah. happened ever since then. And it's, and it's, it's grown a lot. We've, we've, uh, beekeepers have developed a lot more theories about how to do it, what works, you know, uh, yeah. how smoke helps and all that kind of stuff. Um, but the uncertainty about how bees made baby bees um, kept going for an awful long time. So even in, in like the 17th century, so yeah. 17th century, 400 years ago. So, you know, uh, a bit more into the sciences. Uh, yeah, a little bit. And, and there were some people that knew that there was the queen. So that like the Anglo-Saxons had the, the B.O. mother, like the bee mother. They, they, they thought, okay, that's, that's what's going on. But yeah. other, other people still kept the idea that they, um, they were either spontaneously generated or there was coming out of corruption. And so in the 17th century, a beekeeping book even contained recipes as to how to make bees. And I love this recipe. This is a freaking, this is a freaking great recipe for how to make how, how to make a bee. How to make bees. 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 Lots of bees. One source suggested that what you had to do was kill kill an ox and leave yep. it leave it in a locked chamber for forty five days. Good and, call. Yep. And, and granted that there will be there will proceed from it an infinity of bees. <laughs> So, uh, rotting meat gets bees, and it has to be rotting ox meat. Yeah, I think so. And it is all the bees ever. Yeah. So you put it in a locked chamber, and you kill it. You kill this ox, and yep. then I think they. I think either this person is confusing bees and flies, or a little bit, or or it's an intense troll. 
Like it, you're like, okay, you're reading the bee, you're reading the beekeeping book. You probably know a fair bit about beekeeping, but if you're that junior that you don't know how bees are made, then, then try this: kill an ox, put it in your bedroom, don't open the door for forty five <laughs> days, and then see what happens. Shit like what are you bees. doing, junior? Don't come in! Don't come in! But also, like, it's not hard to test that. <laughs> Like to get to the point where you publish it, yeah. If it's not a massive troll, then you 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 moron. Because really, it's not hard to test that one out. Like most recipes, as far as I'm aware, when you publish them, have been done at least once. Yeah, yeah. Maybe it wasn't like that in the 1700s. At the moment, at the moment. Like I think yeah, back yeah, then, okay. maybe things were different. Things were different. It's more entertaining to publish a recipe. Like, okay, you want to make a cake? You want some gravel? You need a hat and maybe I don't know a few flowers. Add water, boom! You got you. That's it. And hey. then, and then, write to me at the end. Tell me how it goes. I, I don't know. I'd like to get mm. some feedback here. Send to me at this address, Greece. Uh, Aristotle had a couple of other dumb B ideas. Uh, he said <laughs> he said that they stored noises in earthen vessels. I, I don't noises. know how you store noises, but I'm not sure what that means. Even no, I've it, seen that happen in cartoons where you fart in a jar and close the lid really tight, and then when you open the jar, <laughs> it goes. <laughs> Exactly like that. Yeah, bees could do that. He also in said earthen that, containers. What he means is underground, or they make pottery as well. Um, Smells know. a lot like bees make pots. Oh, you know what it might be? It might be like the um, the sound. You know, put a shell up your against your ear, and you hear some sort of the ocean. Maybe he thought that yep. was a buzzing like a bee. I don't know. I don't know. Um, Far out. Pretty did, dumb for a smart guy. Okay. Another one. He thought that bees carried little stones with them. Um, so that they didn't get blown away by the wind. When they're flying around in a windy day, they would <laughs> they would carry a tiny little stone to, to stop them from getting blown around, which is in, which is quite a their, cute. Wearing their bee stone harness, like a <laughs> diver's weight belt. No, they got a lot of, lot of arms and legs. So you know, again, an, another one of these things that I mean, I don't think you need a microscope to observe this. <laughs> like, oh, there's a bee flying around. I'm going to net it or swat it. Oh, look, no stones. <laughs> Oh, I dropped them. Fair point. Yeah, drop them. Look, I don't think I don't think in Aristotle's defence or you know the age's defence that there was a lot mm. of peer review. He was just saying stuff, and some of it was yeah. good, and some of it was just saying stuff. That's fair. But he did observe something interesting, uh, perplexing for him. That mm. uh, yeah, um, so he saw that um, if you put a source of food near a hive, um, you know, like a bowl of honey. I don't know. Do bees eat honey? Surely they like honey or some flowers or something. They like that. really do. I was at an outdoor event a couple of years ago where there was some honey on the table. And by the time we'd finished the event, it was being swarmed upon. So they're not and troubled I'm, by that. They're not thinking this is cannibalism or something like that. No, or? they were into it. It was like, okay. fucking great. We don't have to make it. There you go. Okay. So, so, well, that's, that's what it is. So if Aristotle puts down a bowl of honey at his picnic, um, it could remain undiscovered for hours or even days. Like nothing mm. happens. But once a single bee has located the food, yeah, it's on. Many new bees soon yep. arrive. Like the, on, like on for young and old. Bees just turn up. Now he thought uh, what this was is that the bee that found the food um, went and the forager he called it went and led the new bee, led other bees to it. Like come with me, okay. fellas. This is yeah. this is where we go. Now that wasn't right. Um, we've since done a fair bit of work to show that uh, if you capture the forager bee, the recruits will still get there. But at least it what? was a theory. So that means they have telephones or something. Something like that. Carl von Frisch was born in Vienna, twentieth of November, eighteen eighty-six. Uh, the youngest of four sons of uh, the surgeon and urologist uh, Anton von Frisch and his wife Marie Exner. Uh, mm-hmm. Urologist, really. I love that one. So, what would you like to specialize in? Uh, we. Someone's got and, to do and it. everything to do with it. Someone's got to do it. I'm glad they do, but I just I've always wondered about those kind of specialties. It's like, what do you do? I, I'm a date doctor. Like, I'm just proctology. I assume I assume they give them out at the end of end of med school or something like that. Okay. And you get rummage, 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 <laughs> dates. <laughs> you get plastic <laughs> surgery. Woo! Like, look in their defense yeah. to all of them. There's no. You just get to work. Um, on hot people being hot. Like, there, there is no, the yeah. point of medicine is to deal with- Doctor, the, I have a sniffle and I'm very attractive. Oh, well, there you go. There's, the, there's, there's some cold remedy. That's not how it works. The point of medicine is to deal with- No, no, I get it. I get it. I just, I'm always fascinated by people who who specialize in things that I don't even want to know about on myself, but yet other bodies. Sure, sure. I'm and glad they exist. So me too. Makes me I am, go, mm. I am super glad. I'm super glad yeah. that, that people are able to do that. Um, they were actually um, in Vienna at the time. Um, mm. They were not big movers and shakers. I mean, they, but they no. were very much in the university set. Like they were friends in friends, uh, friends in law with uh, Sigmund Freud and stuff like that. So oh, cool. So they're part of the intelligentsia. 
Um, yep. It wasn't a big part of his life, but Von Frisch, um, I'll just call him Von Frisch. He was Carl at the time because he was a kid, but he becomes- Frischy. Frischy. Frischy? No. The Frischster. Von Frisch. Von Frisch was of partial Jewish heritage. His grandmother was Jewish. I think uh, his mother, Marie Exner. Uh, and he was born in what, 1880s? 1886. Which is oh, that's a, good timing for certain events. Yeah, okay. I, don't, I don't know. I don't know what year Hitler was born, but it's pretty much the same year, something like that. Yeah. Um, but uh, as I'll show you now here, he dressed totally German, uh, so maybe that made it okay. Um, every photo, no, not every photo. He, he's, Get serious. He's, wearing, he's actually wearing lederhosen. He's wearing lederhosen, like like he's literally wearing lederhosen. And and some of these photos are of that I've got of him are earlier in life, like when yeah. he's in his thirties uh, and forties. Uh, some of them um, are later in life, in his maybe in his 80s and there's lederhosen he is, he is fuck i admire that like I, I i don't think i could admire a person's dress more that's just like you know not leather leather shorts <laughs> i love it i i think it's fantastic you know, as as a as a national dress to go shorts are our national dress maybe we in australia With some little that. braces as well <laughs> sure. got, it's not just the shorts you've got to wear the little sort of the, the, the structure over your shoulders. Shorts and braces. That's what we need. I want shorts with a harness and they must be made out of leather. <laughs> and a hat with a small brush on it. <laughs> I'm loving it. I'm loving it so much. Um, as a kid, um, he showed a great interest in animals. Um, mm. and, and it was encouraged by his family. So there's lots of stories about him uh, chasing butterflies and, and uh, looking at bees. Uh, all sorts of things like that. And it was encouraged by his family. Um, yep. But... but uh, when he went to university at nine, uh, in 1905, so when he's 21, um, mm -hmm. he enrolled as a student in medicine at the University of Vienna. Basically, his dad said, look, it's awesome that you love animals, but, um, you know, medicine's the family business. You, you know, maybe, maybe it'll be more certain for you. It'll be worth it. Have you doing. thought about wee-wee or bums? <laughs> Medically speaking. And nevertheless, his ugmal, uh, uncle Sigmund, uh, Sigmund Exner, who was oh. uh, Marie's brother, he taught human physiology in the, in the medicine course. And he yep. noticed that von Frisch was still loving animals. He's still all about the animals. And he encouraged von Frisch to take some classes on animal physiology. Oh, insurrection. Uh, so soon von Frisch, uh, Carl is a 21-year-old. He's doing a whole bunch of undergrad research projects on, mm -hmm. the, on the position of pigments in the compound eyes of certain beetles butterflies and crustaceans, and he, he got totally hooked. He's like- so He's doing this very early 20th century. That's some pretty detailed shit. Yeah, yeah. No, he, he, he was big on eyes at this time. Uh, uh, so, eyes are a remarkable piece of meat. Massively. Like, massively. insane. Yeah. So he got totally hooked. And in 1908, when he uh, finished his undergrad degree, he decided to drop out of medicine and yeah. totally dedicate his studies to zoology. He moved to Munich, the Zoological Institute, the University of Munich, where he studied under supposedly the totally famous Richard von Hertwig. I don't. No way. I know. I uh, the von Hertwig. The von Hertwig. Not not one of the. But no. The. Uh, I, I did. I did read another little bit of this story where it was talking about the the absolute titans of the field. So yeah, but I don't know anymore. Okay. Um, now I, I I accept that. It's worth noting at this time. Um, have you have you heard the story of clever hands? Yep. No, I have actually. That sounded more flippant. Yeah, I know Clever Hands. I've used that story because I have a thirty-five thousand-year-old psych degree, mate. Which is basically the age of the Clever Hands story. Uh, pre pretty much, yeah. So it's a great story. It's just worth. This is not. This is not a Von Frisch story, the Clever Hands story. But it's it's no. in the orbit of the time. Um, mm. It's just worth noting that during this period when von Frisch was studying, 1908, there was a whole lot of heightened skepticism around animal behavioral studies. Because, yeah, because Clever Hands had been this German celebrity horse that could do maths. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know Which, what... I mean, if you had a dollar for every time you heard that, you're like, oh, another <laughs> yeah, one, fuck, whatever. The, the German celebrity horse that can do maths. That can do yeah. maths. <laughs> uh, like, it, I mean, I don't know how you tell this story, but um, it can do a, lot, a whole lot of counting. It can do a lot of multiplication. It can do addition. Uh, yeah, anything with numbers that you can bang out with your hand. Sorry, so, hoof. So you'd say to the, say to the horse, um, "What's a thousand times a thousand? Um, and the horse would say, "Too many." And then, you, then let's do something a little bit trickier. No, the three. horse would start going, and you come back in a year. <laughs> or you do, yeah, okay, three times three. Horse taps its foot nine times, and yep. then uh, and then stops tapping, and suddenly everyone's like, "Whoa, this horse can count! This Holy is amazing!" Shit, he's uh, Mister Ed's grandfather. Exactly. Celebrities, scientists, all came to look, and they're like, "Oh God damn, this is awesome." Yep. Uh, Oscar Funkst. Funkst. P 
P F U N G S T, which is fuck me. Germans know how to bang letters together, don't they? <laughs> it's a collection. Your name? Funkst. No, seriously, what's your name? Funkst. That's fabulous. So he recognised. Hang on, this is not yeah. this. Is, Hans Hans does have a talent here. Yes, it, it's not doing maths. It's uh, watching his owner, yep. his trainer, um, and noticing whenever the owner would go, ah, oh, he's got there. Or some or some version of that. Uh, I think wasn't the theory that he would um he would either raise or lower his head as Hans was counting out numbers, and mm-hmm. then he would do the reverse, drop it or lift it yep. as a, a implicit signal to stop. Yeah, absolutely. And so I think it was what, raise then lower, but anyway, it doesn't matter. It was basically that. But the key thing there, it's it's some form of training, and the horse is looking for that cue and yep, knows I, I'm going to be told I'm good. I'm going to get the reward if I keep yep. tapping my foot until he lifts his head. And so it, it tells you a whole lot about um, Pavlovian conditioning or something like that. But it also also for von Frisch says let's be a whole lot more skeptical about anything animal behavioural. We've, sure. we've got to we've got to do good science here, not just yep. let ourselves be led astray. So, von Frisch, when he's doing his PhD, and as he keeps going, um, they tried to establish uh, an objectivist scientific basis for doing animal studies. Fair now, enough. he failed a little bit in this. Um, but we'll oh. come to that later. <laughs> Make it happy before we get to the failures. No, look, no, no. He failed interestingly. He failed interestingly. Mm-hmm. Uh, so in his doctoral thesis, he looked yep. at, um, going back to eyes, he looked at light perception and colour changes in minnows, little fish. Um, how? That's amazing, especially in the early 20th. Like that's They're not that how? little. I mean, they're, they're, they're small. No, but how? I, I, so by looking at their reactions as opposed to whacking an electrode up the eye nerve. and So minnows, minnows change colour. Um, in in response, oh, in response. to okay, their yeah, environment okay. or something like that. Yep. Um, so okay. and and what he showed is that there's an area on their forehead that's like he, uh, it's got sensitive sensory nerve cells. He called it a, a primitive third eye, um, where it's okay. it's detecting some sort of color. So what he did, um, he showed that blind minnows, let's assume, made them blind, um, could react. No, to- it's an ac- accident. Sure, we we found we found thirty blind minnows, uh, yeah. and they can still react to react to the light by changing color in the same way as minnows with sight. So he's, he's okay. Yeah. Um, the the interesting thing is, uh, I'll read this. Von Frisch's discovery contradicted the common belief of his time that fish and all invertebrates were colorblind, and with this he stirred serious discussion yeah. among scientists. Um, yeah. I don't know why you would assume uh, all invertebrates are colorblind. Well, you think about it, like people have had up until extremely recently assumed dogs were colorblind or, or thought they saw evidence that dogs were colorblind. And and I think it's literally this century evidence started to come out going, actually, dogs can see. And they are well above, in theory, invertebrates. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So I'm not as shocked as I would have been if I hadn't heard that, you know, even us very clever 21st century people went, oh, hang on, dogs can see color. We just looked at it wrong. Yeah. Okay. Uh, look, I'll, I'll believe it. I... um. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I mean, I'm 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 less shocked than I could have been in the okay. past. Yeah. Um, he he he. The the leader of the objections to his work at this time was the director of the Munich Eye Clinic. So, of course, you know they're like, no, no, you need you need all of these things to be able to see in color. Uh, yeah. You're not seeing that, and so I don't know. It was just a it's just a type error. Yeah, fair enough. Okay, he finished his he finished his doctorate, and then straight away there's the war. Um, he goes he goes off to uh, he gets called up to service in World War One. But his eyesight was too poor, so he wasn't. Uh, then he went to he volunteered for the uh, Red Cross, um, and he established a bacterial lab- laboratory specialising rapid diagnosis of cholera, dysentery, and typhoid. And at hospital, he met he met a nurse, um, yeah, he did. Uh, Marguerite Moore, who they married in, married in nineteen seventeen. Yeah. yeah, there you yeah. go. Yeah. And they had one son and three daughters. I'm a doctor. You're a nurse. I mean, do I need to say anything else? I don't know if he was. I, I think he was a scientist. There, he wasn't being doctor. He was being scientist. He had a PhD. Yeah, that's true. He was a doctor in that sense, but not did in you, the. Did you not remember? But not in the doctors and nurses sense. Oh, that's a great game. Carry on. <laughs> after the war, after the war, von Frisch got straight back to research, and he wanted to do yep. more stuff with fish. Um, he continued to look at uh, fish behaviour, and yep. at the time there was this big debate, I don't, and I don't know why there was a big debate, but there was whether uh, whether catfish could, reacted to sound, whether catfish could hear. Oh, I cannot wait to hear what happened because I've been thinking about this for a long time lately. <laughs> like it's just been in my head. I wake I know, up thinking you sit about there whether thinking catfish, catfish react to sound. Can catfish hear? Uh, at least six scientists claimed that catfish uh, reacted to sound, and just as many 
found them impervious to whistling and screaming, singing and clapping, and even the scales and trills of a celebrated singer. A celebrated singer, no less. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Because that's what's important. As if they would react to atonal garbage. Well, look, maybe maybe like the like the minnows, they were looking functionally at the, the organs that yeah, the fish had I, and I said- I have a suspicion I know what's going on here. There's no cochlea. So yep. how could they possibly hear? Because they don't have ears that look like ours. Uh, anyway. A, I'm, I'm, I, won't, I won't ruin it, but I'm, I'm, I'm assuming it's a, a problem with the interpretation of the word hear. Mm, yeah, maybe, maybe. Uh, look, it could be. Um, so anyway, Von Frisch got into this. 1923, he published his moderately famous paper, A, cat, <laughs> a, a Catfish That Comes When Summoned by Whistling. Uh, with the, catfish, with, my moderately famous paper, A Catfish That Comes When Summoned by Whistling. By Whistling. You can, you can nearly came like a catfish. Ein Zwergwells de Compte wenn man im Pfeft. Flawless. Absolutely flawless. Now, he argued that uh, previous researchers, uh, you know, you've, you've asked the dumb question because you've tried whistling and screaming to them and singing yeah. and clapping when catfish are much more likely to react to sounds that are in their environment, like an earthworm doing earthworm things or... Very you know. good call. Make it contextually appropriate. Um, yeah. Duh. Yeah, yeah. Th they're not likely to care about a, a singing diva. Is that a plane going by? Well, that really concerns me. Yeah, yeah okay. if, if I were a catfish, I would be interested in earthworms and other such tasty bites, but hardly in the trills of a celebrated singer. One cannot, <laughs> one cannot expect a fish to react to sounds that had no meaning in his life. Uh, but, <laughs> but maybe one could arouse its musical interest by applying the training method that has already proven highly effective in answering other questions. Fish trainer. Fish training. Okay, okay. So, so what he did, for his experiment with the catfish, Von Frisch first surgically removed its eyes so that it could be not cured vis visually. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, to remove any objection from the outset that optical stimuli could have played a part, I had ex extirpated both of the animal's eyes a few days earlier. We'll come back to that because... Um, no, he, it's it's kind of... Uh, he, he describes it much later. Uh, he didn't feel terribly guilty about it. He's like a catfish... Catfish's eyes don't really mean very much to him. Well, also in the words of Kurt Cobain, it's okay to eat fish because they don't have any feelings. And if you can eat them, surely you can blind them. I don't think Frisch thought that. I think he was. I think he was trying to do good science, but I think he was. Yeah, he was also uh, really quite respectful of the animals that he was working with. And okay. so you know, he straight away when he describes this, yes, we needed to do this for research. But after that, I got an old candlestick. It must have been a big candlestick, and made a little house for him. Um, uh, in the in the oh. aquarium, and he scuttled into that very quickly. The the, the blind little fellow. So you know he's oh. he's he's talking about this like he's he's he wants he to look after. And he gave the fish yeah, okay. a name. Um, anyway, a few days later, he began to train the the catfish. Uh, each day he would whistle and then offer a little a little bit of meat uh, on the end of a stick. Right. And you can imagine on the sixth day, the animal reacted to the whistle. Whoa. As soon as Von Frisch whistled, it jerked from its shelter and swam about, apparently in search of food. Von Frisch wasted no time and repeated the performance for Otto Corner, who was one of the big doubters of catfish whistling, uh, <laughs> who apparently sank into his chair and conceded, there is no doubt the fish comes when summoned by whistling. Oh, no, catfish whistling is real. <laughs> this is terrible day for me, but okay. I just want to come back to that one. I'll come back to that one later because it's kind of, there's a nice circle in Von Frisch's life where... You know, <laughs> sinking in your chair and conceding. But if anyone, if anyone is going to get into catfish whistling, surely it's Sutrumans. <laughs> I mean, really, oh, it's wonderful. I'm very happy about that. But also, how fucking amazing to even think about training a fish and better yet, succeed. Oh, I have never like, thought that's really insane. to train a fish. Yeah, but, neither have I. But you whistle and you give it some meat. You whistle and give it some meat. And uh, there yeah, you go. Yeah, come back to my house. Watch this. <laughs> and my fish comes running. <laughs> like, that's... That's you a real panty dropper, that one, I'm sure. You know that would be great. That would be awesome. <laughs> so bee science had progressed a long way since Aristotle. Yeah. Uh, a lot of it happened in the 18th and 19th century. So, you know, they did a bunch of things. So a lot of, a lot of French people uh, with the names of Swammerdam, René-Antoine Ferchold de Rameur, Charles Bonnet, and Francois Huber. Uh, what did they do? They'd use microscopes to dissect bees. Uh, they made a glass-walled observation hive, so you could look okay. inside when they're, when they're doing things. And at that point, they're starting to go, oh, look, it's the queens laying eggs. That's what's going on. 
Hey. They still didn't know how queens were fertilized, um, and so they thought, are they are they are they self fertile? Like they they fertilize themselves? Probably um, a rotting ox meat. I would uh, imagine I, that's might have been it. Or, or is, small stones. Or is there a vapor or miasma emanating from the drones um, mm. that fertilize the queens without direct uh, physical contact? Huber was the first one to show. Ah, oh, the queens do it when they fly away from the hive. And then they fuck with the drones away from the hive and then they come back. So they do it. Oh, way up. They're shy. Did you know that? I did not know that. They do it way up in the sky. Like they're all a long way away from their hive. They, they don't they like. They sky bang a drone and then they come back and shit nine million eggs. Yes. Yes. So, that, so maybe you're going to tell me this, but if you're not or you don't know, they bang one drone and they can lay a billion eggs. Like is it one bang many babies? I'm not going to tell you that because I don't know, but I think they do have some sort of semen holding sack. Um, it's definitely well, we it's, do, what, I, what I will guarantee you. It is not one bang, one baby. It's it is definitely it's busy time because because I think that you know, given the amount of babies that I think something like fifteen hundred babies a day or fifteen thousand babies a, a day, day. Yeah, yeah. There's there's a lot. There's a lot. Like it's a lot. So so what I'm saying is, if you have to stop to go outside and bang. Times. <laughs> hang on, <laughs> hang on, hang on. That would be exhausting. Oh, me, no. And I think yeah. I think evolution would say let's let's do it a bit different. Let's do it. A little yeah, bit yeah. Different. Yours are going to die. The ones that don't have to do that might live. And yeah, obviously, okay. the wholesome show is a very sex positive show. But if you're banging fifteen hundred or fifteen thousand times a day, um, and having a child after every encounter. <laughs> So, I feel like that doesn't leave a lot of room to do anything else. Like it really doesn't. It really. But uh, yeah, you know, bee queens are not famed for doing anything else. Um, That's true. All right. So so at that point, they 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 had confirmed by looking inside and seeing that the hive consists of one queen, it's the mother of all of the female workers and the male drones. Yep. Um, and and so they're they're learning. Okay. So that's it. The sperm store. The spermathicia. Spermathica. S- so, yeah. Spermathicopter. So I didn't think about that. So all hives are wildly inbred. Uh, yes, yes. I just never thought of that. Like, I wonder. So the drones come from. I wonder how they then get outside DNA. That's an interesting question, and yeah. I'm not going to give you any answers to that at all. Well, you in don't this know, podcast. and neither did I. But it just that's the first time I ever thought about it because I was aware, roughly speaking, that they you know they keep it in house. Unless, unless, unless they're flying away to to get a drone from another hive. Get a bit of strange. Keep it, keep it real. Keep I it think healthy. it would be sensible to get a bit of strange at that point. I would imagine unless bees don't work the same way as almost every other kind of animal that I'm aware of, and obviously my knowledge of biology is All extremely right. deep. That one there is a question on notice. We'll have to ask our bee expert, uh, Saul Cunningham, or something like that about that. Or bee. Indeed, indeed. Uh, B, can you tell us later? But in the early 20th century, uh, Aristotle's mystery of bee recruitment still remained. And so von Frisch, he of the catfish whistling, Took mm. up the mantle. Uh, 1917, von, Karl von Frisch decided to start applying his sensory work on fish to bees. In particular, he started off by studying their sense of colour. Because you can guess at this time, again, they thought there's no way that bees can see colour. No um, way. Because they're too small. Which is just weird because bees go for flowers which are colourful. Well, they are to us. Yeah, but how could... How could huh? I mean, why, huh? would, why would flowers have gone, let's be colourful? If the, the whole thing that flowers have wrapped around is, is largely pollinators is like, it like why not all be gray maybe maybe they also are colorful because they're pretty and we like it and they've done it for us there's reasons not for us it's it's clearly not for us <laughs> anyway he he started studying uh their sense of color uh, yeah. but he also noticed that uh like aristotle many years ago they would continue to come to a recently emptied food dish as if he thought to monitor its contents when he yeah. replenished the dishes supply uh yeah. more bees would come but they've got some sort of system of getting more bees to come. Um, von Frisch. So it smells of memory and communication. It's it's something. It's something. Mm. Uh, he he thought okay, they've got to have some sort of way that they're alerting all their buddies. How do you yeah. how do you come along? And he decided okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna pursue that. And uh, he called that the most fateful observation of his life. Oh. Um, so what he did the first thing after feeding at a nearby food dish, this is 1919, a forager bee made a curious round dance that seemed to incite its fellows to follow it excitedly uh, okay. and then fly out to the same feed. Yeah. He saw this dance and he thought, there's got to be something in that. Sure. It, took, it took him a long time to confirm this, but he dived in. His first inv- innovation, the first thing that he did that was really quite unique at the time, was to start looking at individual bees. 
So instead of looking at the whole hive and saying, okay, we're seeing people, bees flying around, we're seeing honey, we're seeing drones and stuff like that, yep. he, he developed a little system where he could paint the, paint the bees um, with little dots. He was the first guy to do that because I've, I've seen little docos on that, but I didn't realize it started that yeah, early. It's, and it's, and it's, it's so cute. That, like, I mean, this is not his system. I'll just show you. These are, this is a modern version where it's way easier. You can just see the... Um, they look like, like pool balls. You can see numbers and shit. Yeah, little, little, yeah, pool balls is basically it. So little colored numbers. So this is B number 19, uh, yellow 19. This is yellow, number yeah. red 15, white 13, something like that. Um, he had a, a more simple system that was yeah. um, five different dots in different spots. And I think they might have been different colors, but uh, he, didn't sure. pay, he didn't pay the journal printing fees for color. So I, <laughs> I, I, I couldn't tell what they were. Um, but he could count up to 599 different bees. But the key thing, it doesn't oh, even wow. matter. It doesn't even matter. All mm. you need to do is be able to recognize one bee and mm. be able to watch it for a little while. Yep. It's so hard to do when uh, you just look at a collection of bees and it's not even racist to say they all look alike. Um, isn't it? Isn't it though? I don't know. Like, I'm, I'm worried about you, man. You used to care. You used to be into diversity, but now you're like all oh, bees look alike. What's next? This is a slippery slope. <laughs> next thing to be like all oh, lizards look alike, and, and so this let him see when he's looking inside the the observation hive. Finally, he can see. Okay, so they're doing the dance inside the hive, and yeah. and there's two different kinds of dance. Um, the ones that had fed at the food dishes. Is, is it the Charleston? And, and then uh, some kind of twerking. Yes, Charleston and twerking are the, yeah. are the, are the two dances. <laughs> They're quite distinct. Crunking. And uh, look, I feel, very, <laughs> I feel very old right now if I'm trying to name any other dances. <laughs> From the Charleston <laughs> and twerking? <laughs> the robot, the running man. I mean, what, you know, what do you got? The Charleston is such a wackadoo dance. Like, who says I let's fucking dance love it. I love a time when that the- was like, let's do that. Ding, 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 oh, ding, it, ding, ding, ding. But it also is it very roaring twenties. They look like they're having fun. Like you are, you are, you know. You know why? Because they're all on freaking meth. Like they are off their tits. Those people. <laughs> they are absolutely wasted, and they're on uppers. Not the we worst. forget that olden. No, we forgot that olden day people did a lot of drugs. They did. They did. And like a lot of drugs. It almost sounds like that. That should be an episode that we should cover in the wholesome show. Uh, so two kinds of dances. Those that fed at the food dishes uh, did the circle dance. So they're, they're mm-hmm. sort of spinning in this circle. Ah, um, okay. Yep. And those returning from natural food sources did a waggle dance. So they're waggling their bum around a lot. I don't know what the bees really? is called. I- I'd heard about the waggle, but I didn't realize that that's interestingly specific. Don't hold that in your head because that's- It's gone. That's wrong. Uh, already forgot so it. I don't is, know what we're talking about. So this is his first thought. In 1923, he thought, yeah. okay, um, I reckon that the shape of the dances indicate the type of food that they visited. So okay. a round dance stood for nectar or, you know, uh, something like yeah. that. And the waggle dance meant, po- meant pollen. Um, uh, he, well, uh, not unreasonable. Very human perspective, but fair enough. So, well, I mean, they were the two variables that he saw. Uh, yeah. But he regretted that. No. Oh. We'll come back to that later because uh, in the meantime – the Nazis were growing closer. In 1923, uh, Hitler, who was literally just down the road, uh, staged the Beer Hall Putsch, uh, which was his first attempt to overthrow the government. Um, and it's literally a kilometre or so from von Frisch's office. And where are we? 20s, 30s? 1923, in Munich, 20s. 1923. So yeah. I had a look at this. Uh, the Beer Hall Putsch, it started outside a beer hall, strangely, mm. and mm. marched to the town hall. Um, and it didn't go past von Frisch's office, but it, it was like within within a couple of hundred meters or something like that. So God, in we, hindsight, holy we, shit, we are right there in there. Yeah. Ten years later, uh, March nineteen thirty three, Hitler and the Nazis came to power. Under the civil service laws, academics had to produce documentary proof of their Aryan ancestry. Oh God! As you remember, one of von Frisch's mm. grandparents was Jewish. At first, you couldn't teach in the university if you were one quarter Jewish, and then it moved to one eighth. Now, he was shielded for a while, in part because he was he was an important scholar. He was the director of the uh, the Zoology Institute. Um, yeah. But in October 1941, he was finally forced out. Uh, the campaign against him, and I'm glad that we've got this name because it's it's nice to call out assholes. Uh, yeah, yeah. The campaign against him was led by Ernst Berg- Bergdolt, a lecturer in botany at his institute who wrote to the Ministry of Education calling for von Frisch's dismissal on grounds of his failure to make his research on bees do ideological work for the Nazis. Well, if I may be uh, so bothered as to say, well, fuck you, von, what was it? Von, fuck you? Ernst, Ernst Bergdolt. 
But fuck you, Ernst. Who writes to who writes to the Minister of Education to dob on on someone? But he didn't. Someone I mean, who knows their work is shit, and the only way they're going to climb up is by bagging out others. That's scum. It's that's who scum. But also, yeah, I like this. I like this line. His failure to make his research on bees do ideological work for the Nazis. Well, yeah, some bees aren't blonde, you know. <laughs> actually, actually, I will come back to that later. But here's here's what a time. here's the thing, and it's just. It's really, it's horrible, but it's a ray of little bit of light in this. The bees saved von Frisch, because how did they know he could he could well have been uh, put into a concentration camp, of course, yeah, right. um, as someone of uh, Jewish ancestry. His grandmother, yep. his grandmother was Jewish, uh, but in 1941, uh, a bee virus ran through all of the beehives of Germany. Uh, oh, that's a big deal. Hundreds yeah. and thousands of bee colonies. As we know, bees are really yep. important for farming. It was the yep. no- Nosima epidemic. And it destroyed thousands and thousands of colonies and wrecked farming. And you, this is a time when uh, obviously food is going to be very important. So, so suddenly uh, being an eighth Jewish doesn't matter at all because we're going to die. Literally, literally. A ra- this I've never seen this before. A rare exception. Actually, I, I'll give you a, a spoiler for another episode I'll do in a few weeks' time when we can do I'll, this. I'll forget, don't worry. No, post-lockdown. Uh, yeah. I've got another rare exception, and it's 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 such okay. a another it's another interesting story. But a yeah. rare exception was made. His work was deemed critical to the Reich's food supply because he knew a lot about bees, yeah. and uh, and he was allowed to not only keep his job, but uh, isn't it? I mean, I, I know there are other forces at play here, but the idea that you could do that, you go like, no, nah, they're all evil, they're wrong, they're stupid, they're despicable. Oh, this one's really useful. Oh, he's okay, but. <laughs> Uh, I know. Like, seriously, guys, seriously, for uh. fuck's sake, seriously, like, be consistent at least. <laughs> they were, they were quite. No, quite no, <laughs> any, any exception to the Nazi rule, which is extreme and complete, shows that they didn't even believe in that. That's true. They didn't. They didn't. Yeah. Uh, look, look, uh, let's, let's agree that they were scum. And, uh, and, but, but and you know what I mean? Like, come on, that's ridiculous. Like, oh no, actually, so now being uh, an eighth Zurich, it does not matter because we need him. Like, well, then you, everything you're talking about is bullshit. <laughs> like, everything you're talking about is bullshit. <laughs> no, it's okay because he knows bees and he needs them. Like, fuck off. Uh, carry on. Summer of 1944 is what I told you before about Munich getting bombed. It's getting mm. bombed hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times. Uh, by well, a million planes by a million at planes. a time. So obviously I've got the numbers wrong because I literally said 74 and and uh, 1,500 planes at a time. But anyway. 74 times feels, is hundreds. It feels like a lot. So, Like it matters. Imagine getting bombed the second time. Oh, God. You're like, I mean, once, Jesus Christ, second time you're like, all right, might as well be infinity. Once you get to three, I don't care if it's three or 74, like it might as well be hundreds. Yeah. I got so, you back, man. So Von Frisch and his family um, yeah. took his family and fled back to their family home in Lower Austria. He was one of the um, the whole group of people that the forty percent of the of Munich that um, abandoned the city. And okay. you know, this is when he took his chance to go. Forget about the war. I just I just do more bee science. And oh. so he got a bit of a sabbatical from doing. Uh, uh, whatever it was, looking after the Nazi hives or doing the managing of the Zoological Institute, he's gone into <laughs> home lockdown and he just spend times with his, spends time with his hives. Gentleman scientist. So here's where he gets to finally solve the riddle. Um, so he previously thought that the dance um, was the, right. the waggle meant it was nectar and the circle was savoury food or something like that. Well, uh, it wasn't it like non-natural or something? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. But he, it, was, like. it was type of food. That's what he'd done. Yep. But yep. This, time, this time he noticed that the bees that foraged nearby did the circle dance and those that one that fed further away did the waggle dance. Ah. So he started thinking, all right, let's do some experiments here. We'll move the food dishes further away from the hives and he could, he could see that they would shift their dance. Suddenly right. they're doing a different dance. They start doing a circle and then they're doing doing waggle. Okay. So he he said that look, maybe they've got a word for distance. Yeah. Which is just he started using words here. Like he, he yeah. started using the word language. He started using the word word. Uh, that a lot of people are like, slow down there. Mm. Slow down. You don't get to use those words. 
But eventually he did these um, cool s- series of experiments. The first was the fan experiment where he'd put food at different um, directions to see yep. if they could work out uh, directions. Very good at working out the directions to go. And he did- By working s- out, you mean also communicating directions. Yeah, yeah, that's it. That's what I meant. I didn't even mean working out. I meant communicating. Yeah, yeah. Um, and he did a, a step experiment where he'd, he'd move the food further and further away. Right. Um, so what he's doing, he's training them, and basically he works out two things. The bees have words for, for two things. One was the distance, yep. um, so they can communicate that via the waggling. So basically one second of waggling equals one kilometre, which is just... No freaking way. I know. It's just... You, you, you what? Bees are decimal? Yeah, they're, de- they're decimal, and they've got... Do you hear that, America? Well. Do you hear that? It is natural, you freaking clowns. <laughs> let it go. Miles make no sense. No bee is dancing. This is one mile. 1.6 waggle dancers does not exist. <laughs> Well, actually, it might be different in America. Yeah, it probably does as it, well. It might be different because- Oh, the, they, they waggle for miles. No, the, there are some people doing, um, uh, what would you call it? Uh, inter- American inter- inter- Intercultural bee linguistics, where you're looking at bees in different countries to see if they have different words. Oh, God, there's so many. Then the market's saturated. But there, yeah, so one second of waggling is basically a kilometre. And then, you know, when you get to the, the angles- this is this. So they had the, uh, the direction that the bees lined up inside the hive. So remember, they're doing this inside the hive, which is normally yep. t- totally dark. Yep. If they were going straight up and down, that means head towards the sun. Right. If they go like forty-five degrees off, straight up and mm. down, that means head forty-five degrees away from the sun. So they've got they've got words here. That, but also left and right because the sun. Yeah, yeah, left know, and right, left yeah. and right. Yeah. So here's the cool thing. So the bees can communicate the direction and the distance of the food that you want to go to just by their cool. dance, just by their dance. So they're waggling and then, so they'd waggle along a little bit and then do a circle to turn around and do more waggling. So they're, yeah, they're, yeah. they're repeating this over and over again to show how far to go and in what direction. And this is, this is the thing. It's symbolic communication. Like yeah. they are using, they are using abstract symbols, either the, the amount of time that I dance or the direction I dance to represent something in the outside world which to this point, no one but humans had ever done. Yeah, hieroglyphics and uh, Chinese characters. Yeah. It's just, it's just off the charts. Fucking fabulous. It's just off the charts. So um, he did a bunch. He did a bunch of experiments at the time to try and confirm all of this. Yeah. So uh, I'll just, I'll just say these now because they're wackadoo. Um, he sealed the bee's pheromone glands with shellac just to show that it wasn't odors. Um, cool. Uh, he put obstacles in their way, including a twelve-story building. Still could get around that. He uh, put a building in their way. Yeah, that's he, that's. He, what do you need this money for? Your research. I need to put. Uh, I need to build a twelve-story building because I'm looking way, at how bees talk. Could you just do eight stories? Would eight stories be yeah. enough? No, no, no. It won't work. It won't work. <laughs> um, he also tipped hives on their sides to see if the bees would get confused. And they did. And, and they, they did. didn't. Yeah, they did. No, they're they're well, like they the, what? What fucking direction is anything now? Um. <laughs> Uh, That's true because we don't build hives this way, so nothing makes sense. Here's how he said it at the time. It's conceivable that some people will not believe such a thing. Personally, I also harboured doubts in the beginning and desired to find out whether the intelligent bees of my observation hive had not perhaps manifested a special behaviour. I opened an ordinary hive, lifted up one of the combs and watched the expected dances. So even this is not even in his special observation ones. Uh, He turned the combs in different ways and they still, uh, so he's figuring all of this out. Still the waggling dance goes in the same direction. So Excellent. Yeah. So people, people all over the place were shocked. They were just like, this is ridiculous. Now, some people loved it. There was a whole bunch of researchers yeah. that are like, this is so cool. You figured out the waggle dance. Um, beekeepers in particular love this because it, mm. it made bees look super smart, which they liked. Other people were furious. Can I, can I guess just that we're particularly religious People not happy. I don't it know. Humanity weren't the superior. Uh, well, actually, I'll go with. Um, so the one I've got here is um, a Hungarian psychologist who Geza uh, Revez. Uh, he published a pointed piece for the Psychological Review in which he attacked the zoologist's inappropriate description of the term language to animal communication. He warned of the dangerous anthropomorphism of the misnomer. Uh, animal sounds were just effective and they bore no relation to their meanings. He drilled in and he, he definitely used language that wasn't, he wasn't bringing up religion, but he was definitely saying things like humans are special. We do symbolic communication. It is impossible. Therefore, it is impossible for anyone else to do it. Like that's- What a ridiculous statement too. Oh, no, no. The, the sounds have no bearing to their meaning. Like, what, what are you talking about? Like, anyway, sorry. 
Carry on. Yeah. So um, talk about terror. Terror of your discipline being, you know, perverted or infiltrated. Oh, like, that suddenly, like suddenly down. we're not as special as we once were. Yeah, I, I, that, that's why to me it stinks of particularly, you know, fervent religious or Christian types. I'm talking about. Here. I think it might be. I don't have, have evidence for that. that, but I think there was yeah. certainly there was an element to which we are special because of symbolic communication. Well, it's been going on for centuries. The, the Christian position, you know, like Copernicus getting destroyed because he said the Earth's not the center of the world. Galileo for I don't know drawing pictures of dicks on on things, but whatever it was, <laughs> I think that's what it was. That's why he got you know excommunicated. Um, but that that religious position, severe religious Christian position, has always the moment you knock humanity out of that hallowed position for whatever reason, yep. you become a monster. And that's and I it. can imagine that's, this being exactly that. That's the deep down thing. I need to be at yep. the top. And if your research shows yep. anything else, then then it's wrong, evil, bad, and horrifying. Yeah. So the the last biggest pushback against uh the symbolic communication of bees, the bee dance, came in 1967. Adrian Wenner. Adrian Wenner uh, began his career, he says, believing in the bee dance language. In the 1940s, yep. he was stationed with the US Navy in California, and he spent a whole bunch of time with his beekeeper uncles. I'm not sure if you're with the Navy, you should spend time with your beekeeper uncles. I'm not, I don't know how that happened. Also, if you're having a chat with someone, they go, I spend a lot of time with my beekeeper uncles. You're like, stop, <laughs> Un- unpack that for me. <laughs> Clarence and Leo. I, I, yeah. Clarence and Leo, my beekeeping uncles. I don't want to talk about it anymore. It sounds nice. It sounds really wholesome on a, on a farm in California. Um, and so they told him a whole lot about commercial beekeeping. Um, yep. And he reckons they indoctrinated him into the dance language theory at this oh, time. those jerks. He reckons, he reckons all these beekeepers accepted it because they, were, they just loved the animals. Um, so anything okay. that would change their status um, would have a warm reception. And I get it because I assume yeah, a lot yeah, of beekeepers yeah. do yeah. actually think quite – Fondly, if they're little bees, they're cute little. So it's reverse the Christian thing. You, you, the the severe Christian. You've brought the bees up a notch. We love that because we love the bees, which is a really interesting scientific thing. Because we shouldn't do that. We shouldn't deliberately make things uh, equal when they're not, just because we like them. Shouldn't make things anything unless we have evidence for it. There you go. You're a good scientist. Boom. Good. Drops the science, Mike. Now, he looked at the world a little bit differently, uh, yep. maybe because he did uh, a lot of uh, electronics and stuff like that, and he was looking at data and mm. radio waves and sound. Um, so he and his student, Dennis Johnson, published side-by-side side pieces in science that challenged some of von Frisch's um, fundamental claims. Uh, right. They said that, look, maybe dancers contain some, some sort of information, but um, – they, they reckon it still could be that other things are going on. You haven't rigorously controlled this enough for odour and it could be just the sound that they're communicating to each other. So, you know, the length of the... So. Not not an unreasonable set of criticisms, though. If you haven't controlled for it, you can't measure it, you can't be sure. Yeah, so so he, <coughs> he, he led uh, through all of these um, uh, other ways of thinking about it. Um, but the, okay. cool, the cool thing is, so Von Frisch and, and Wenner had a bit of a stoush over a couple of years, like 1967, 68, 69. They're firing letters back into each other in, in Science Magazine. And, um, be fight! Be fight! No, literally. Uh, so Stuart Altman, who was a famous primatologist at the time, declared it one of the few non-sterile controversies in the study of animal behaviour. So it was, it was a legitimate fight. Um, non-sterile is a hell of a way to describe isn't it. Isn't it? <laughs> this is a non-sterile controversy. What's do, a sterile controversy? I, I do like that all other controversies are described as sterile. He's just sterile. Like, like, sterile. Like, we had a fight over the colour of the folders in which we file our stuff. It's like, I, but that's still not sterile. Blue versus green. I mean, I don't know. So there, so there are a lot of people saying, look, it can't be symbolic. There could be other things. There could be a lot of odour cues going on. Could sure. be, uh, could be a whole bunch of other things. But here's, here's, here's something really cool. And just want to inspire you undergraduates out there. Uh, the debate was resolved in 1970 by three undergraduates from Caltech. Uh, Fuck yeah. So, Caltech though, but yeah. Okay. Yeah, you know, we know many. Still, ma- <laughs> still Caltech. <laughs> <laughs> James, James L. Gould, Michael Henry and Michael McLeod, undergraduates at Caltech at the time, they published a piece in Science where they Of just- course they did, like all undergraduates do. <laughs> a, they published, B, they did it in Science. That's just what happens. If you're and- listening and you're in our courses- why haven't you published in science? And C, yet? they've resolved a controversy. And D, I'll tell you the non-sterile ending. one. I'll, I'll tell you the ending in a second. Mm. Um, uh, they uh, so they modified the original fan experiment to add in a bunch of Wenner's criticisms and some Fair other ch- some other challenges that were out there. Uh, they attempted to control for any odors that might have helped to guide the bees in their food. Uh, so they shellacked the bees' noses. I think something like that. Yep. Um, and so they proved without a doubt that, uh, Von Frisch's, uh, waggle dance was the right way to look at this. That's awesome. I love that. 
By 1973, uh, remembering Otto Connor, Otto Connor, uh, 50 years earlier, who no. at, the, at the whistling catfish sank in his chair and considered, there is no doubt, the fish, <laughs> the fish comes when summoned by whistling. When I withdrew from, hey. when I withdrew from all further bee studies, he's like, oh. <laughs> I'm done. There's no point in continuing. Everything is ruined. And in that same year, Von Frisch was selected by the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm to share the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine. Fuck yeah, he was. I know. I know. So he retired from teaching in 1958, uh, okay. 15 years before he won the Nobel. Um, and then, yeah, so won the Nobel 50 year, uh, 15 years after he finished teaching. Uh, he died oh, in so he, he June 1982. Classic. Like, so he's a thousand year old Nobel winner as yeah, any of the Yeah, really yeah. quite really quite old. And and yeah. you know, this is for research that yes, he had done over a long period. Yeah. Uh, but it was a long way later and he was definitely well into his uh what are we talking? Uh his nineties when he won the Nobel. Is that right? Yeah, eighteen eighty six. Uh Close enough. I can't do maths, it's Friday. 80, 80 somethings. Eighty somethings. Uh, it's. I mean, look. I mean, it's easy for us to think it wouldn't matter if you're 90, but I'm sure when I'm 90, if someone gave me a Nobel, I'd be like, "Yeah, fuck yeah, I feel good oh, about that." Oh, totally, totally. I'm going to tell all the old biddies down the corridor <laughs> about this one. Anyone else got a Nobel? You boom. No, it's like awesome. It's awesome. Yeah. Um, yeah, he died nine years later in 1982. One assumes, as he probably was all the way through his life, a happy guy. I think that he was he was a like in everything I've read about him, he seemed like a, a super chill guy. And this is the interesting thing. Um, yeah. This there's a lot of people that are writing about von Frisch saying what he did was actually different. So there was that um, clever hand stuff where there were people were mm. duped by it. Um, but he tried to be scientific in everything that he was doing. He was trying to be well, as objective. There wasn't a suggestion could. that I'm aware. I may be wrong that clever hands was deliberately manipulated. He just it okay. was just sloppy. Yeah, I may be wrong, but I, th yeah. I think it was just sloppy. Just sloppy. No, I yeah. think Von Frisch was like, I want to not be sloppy. But yeah. he did something else that's different to a lot of the other people that were working at this time. He actually thought of bees as individuals. And there's there's these yeah, quotes yeah, about yeah. this. Yeah. Um, he had like, uh, he talked about his bees as personal friends. Uh, when he thought of them also <laughs> okay. as profound. That's taken a bit further than just No, no, no. He, like he warmed them in his cupped hands when the cold stiffened their wing muscles. They mm. were his bees in the same way an anthropologist of the past might have fancied the remote tribe amongst um, which he lived to be his tribe. The same mixture of science, sentiment, and proprietor pride. So and he took, ca humans he as took care of their okay, welfare. No, I know, but he took care of their welfare. <laughs> no, I know what you mean. While still doing science, like he had, he had no hesitation in snipping their antennae, shellacking up their noses or whatever, doing things to them, but he still did care about them as much as he could. And he still tried to see them as individuals, which is, is the reason wow. that Wenner was wrong and the reason that he was the first to be able to see the waggle dance and to be able to understand all of yeah, this. Yeah, 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 yeah. So the idea that, yeah, if you, if you stick with your original prejudices or your, if you can, some, sorry, not stick with, if you can somehow break through and go, wait a minute. Let's imagine we don't conceive of these things the same way as everyone always conceived of them. Yeah. That might make a difference. I don't know what difference, but let's give it a crack. And that's what he did. He really, yeah, he that's really big thought, thinking. Let's, let's look at this different. So people have built on his work since. Um, and it's, you know, it's shown that bees uh, don't use this just for food. Uh, they use it to point to water. And also really interestingly, the, the fascinating one is when, the, when a hive decides, okay, it's time to make a new hive. When we, yeah. when we got to move house, the bees all go outside the hive. Um, they, they form a beard like 30 meters away. So it's like temporary. We're all outside. Then they send out all of the worker, the worker bees, the foragers to go and look for new places. They come back and they all do waggle dances to, to show how far away and how good it is. They go and check and they do this whole system of democracy and they, they sort of vote for, vote for different ones. When they copy the different dances of the ones they like the best. And then eventually they've all gone, okay, this is the one to go. They move. And here's the cool thing. In the local area, it's almost by far the best choice. Like if you look around and you've got, you know, a bunch of different hollow logs and crevices yeah. and stuff like yeah. that, the bees do this weird form of democracy where they, they look at what each other are doing and then vote on the best one. And it's, it's just so cool. I'm just, do you know, the fact that they end up with a great decision surprises me the least of all those things. Cause if they're genuinely assuming, and this is a huge assumption, bees aren't egotistical. They have no vested interest in you're like, why, why don't you go with my site? Yep. It's like, here's my site. Here's what I reckon I'm going to tell you all about it. And everyone else goes, yeah, but Keith's site, yep. right? It's got the extra waggle and the wiggle and the bum and the blah, blah, blah. And, he, and he's like, you, you'd go, fuck yeah, Keith's site rocks. Like, Mine's nice? great, but his is awesome. So I'm not surprised that they make a smart decision because it sounds like, I'm anthropomorphizing, I don't know, 
they just go on the evidence. This is the this is the interesting thing. Like the Nazis wanted him to show that bees. Um, in some sense, you know, they've got they've got a hierarchy. You know, everyone in the hive has to do the thing for the um, for the system, and um, yeah. he he refused all the way along. He said, "No, look, look, they they don't. They uh, this is how they communicate, I think, and this is the way that they kind of make decisions. So it's nothing like this Nazi ideology. There's a they bit of communist. Well, it, the thing that the thing that's kind of a, a sting is he kept he kept this discreet all the way he said look no i mean this is that they are you know bees are in some sense is a communist thing but he had yep. to share the nobel prize with conrad lorenz who did think that uh that yeah, yeah. at the same time they won it at the same time who was a literal nazi um and <laughs> and did animal studies that did show that did attempt to show oh the nazi way of organizing society is the right way to go so basically frisch would have been fucked if there hadn't been a bee plague yeah it was saved by the bee That's plague. It. If the bees weren't dying, he would have. Saved by the bee plague. Oh, one final thing. Um, he had uh, three brothers. So there were four brothers um, yep. of Anton and Maxine. All of them went on to become university professors. Damn right they did. There That's how it happens. Uh, Do they all get Nobel Prizes though? I don't know. I don't think so. I don't think no. so. No. So there's one winner. There you Only go. Only one winner. There you go. Symbolic communication. I just... I, uh, you know, I think it's a, it's a it's an awesome story. The bees saved him. He found the bees. Yeah. There you go. Happy ever after. They saved him because he treated them like people, man. Did did treated them like people, like we do. The wholesome show is me, Will Grant, and him, Rod Lamberts. We're supported by the Australian National Centre for the Public Awareness of Science, and B, love your bees. Yeah, if you're not listening, B, you will be. We'll be back next week, listener. Oh, live show. Yes. Click on the Twitter or something like that. Wednesday the, what do we say, 8th. There you go. Wednesday the 8th, you'll find it. <laughs>